It is our joy to have back with us, I think the cool kids say that we've, uh, we've known each other for about a good minute now or something like that, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't tweet or book anybody's faces, but uh, 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 I will say this. We've been supporting Mark here at Roosevelt longer than I've been here. Uh, and uh, it's been my joy to be a part of uh, Mark's ministry in a number of ways, and I, I'm sure that you all uh, would agree it has been our joy to be a part of that work. Um, uh, just a quick reminder, not only is he uh, the one that God used to plant Living Hope Bible Church in South Africa, uh, but he raised up and invested in Denver. Solomon, you remember Denver and, and Gaynor that we had for a number of years, and now Denver is back, and I believe Living Hope is as big as Roosevelt, if not a little bit bigger at this point, because of their active involvement in evangelism. So that's a really, really exciting thing. And uh, David and Lucy went and filled that pulpit uh, for a few years while Denver was here. And now he's up north and uh, are actively involved in ministry. And a great deal of this is the fruit of Mark's ministry. And uh, it has been my joy, uh, really, uh, to support the work that the Lord has been doing with uh, in you from the time I first got here. And I, uh, I particularly remember the expression that we were, what is it, about a week uh, into doing Genesis with you guys and you drive me all over South Africa and, and uh, whatnot and put me next to the uh, loudest snorer on the planet. Now granted, I brought him with me, but still. <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, so uh, it, that's when the expression, uh, a brother from another mother came up, and I heard that, and I, uh, ever since then, I have really appreciated that expression, because I think it's very, very appropriate description. Uh, there, are, um, there are a number of people I love and respect on this planet, but there are a few that I uh, appreciate as much as I appreciate Mark Christopher. And uh, your diligence and your faithfulness, not only to invest your life in the church, and in the saints, and to preach the word, and to shepherd the flock, and to stand for the truth no matter what, together with a commitment to raising up the next generation to carry on the work that God has called us to do is just, uh, uh, it's a real blessing to me. And uh, to, uh, to be able to have a small part in continuing to support you in ministry has been my joy and our blessing, and we're thrilled to have you. So, Mark, come on up and share the word with us. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop there. <laughs> it didn't drop, so I, don't, I was all prepared to get up here and say somebody's got to be the bigger person, and we know it can't be him, so it'll have to be me. Um, and then he gives that flowery, oratorical uh, introduction. So I don't know. I, I'm not sure what's going on at home, brother, but I'll pray for you. I, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, he's never done that before. I mean, this is so out of character for him. So he's, he's pretty much typecast for those types of things. But uh, we love him. And, uh, you know, he talks about being the, uh, bro we're brothers from another mother. You might pray for our mother. I mean, that's, that's really what you might want to pray for. But what a joy to be with you this morning. And uh, when I walked in this morning, some of you looked at me as if the wind had blown. blown. You're like, who do, look what the wind blew in. Well, the wind literally did blow me in this morning. So uh, ever since I arrived uh, in, at LAX uh, a week ago Thursday, the, the weather has been uh, rather atrocious. Uh, it's just more of that global warming that they're sending our way. And when you've come from the Southern Hemisphere in 90 degree weather, it's hard to adjust to all of this. So uh, next week, I, after Shepherd's Conference, I'm up to the Bay Area and been looking at the long range forecast. I think it's gonna rain the whole time until I finally fly back to South Africa. So anyway, I'm glad I could be with you this morning, even though it's for such a short time. And just before I preach, just a quick, quick update. I know you have communion and all of that this morning. Um, Brian did mention uh, the Solomons, and I had the privilege of preaching at Living Hope uh, about six or seven weeks ago when Denver heard his back. And what a blessing it was to see that little building packed to capacity. Literally, I'm not exaggerating, they're hanging on to the walls there. And you might pray for them that God would grant them a permanent facility. 
and uh, God is doing great things there, and he has, he's doing exactly what I taught him to do, to develop a hunger for the Word, and he has so many young men who are interested in full-time vocational ministry and are now part of our Berean Bible Institute, and uh, it's just a, a real blessing to see how God is using both Denver and Gaynor there and uh, to continue the work that was begun there many years ago. And uh, so pray for them, and I know they would appreciate it. God is doing great things. But also with all of that growth come the growing pains. So uh, it certainly isn't without its problems as well. But pray for Living Hope Bible Church and for the Solomons. And I did get to see uh, David fall in December at a meeting up country and had some wonderful fellowship with him. When I arrived there where we were staying at the, it's a small game ranch where they had the meeting and uh, we, I arrived there and they said, uh, well, where do you want to put your stuff? And all these guys descended on the car and took my bags because I'm such an old frail man now that everybody thinks they have to carry their bag for me. And, uh, well, where do you want to sleep, uh, brother? And uh, I said, well, g- give me the options. They said, well, there's still a room in Dave- their bed in David Fall's room. I said, uh, no, I'll take the next building. Thank you very much. Um, so I've, uh, I'm not going down that road. So, um, but uh, we had some wonderful fellowship, and the Lord is blessing their work. Uh, they're about... 45 minutes, maybe half hour uh, west of Johannesburg. And uh, so God is doing some great things there. He seems very happy and content in ministry uh, as he works in that revitalization work. So, um, and then as far as we're concerned, Debbie is not with me. As your pastor aptly said before I came in one of his many disparaging emails to me, he said, I see you're not coming without, uh, you're coming without adult supervision this time. And so he's right. I'm not here with any adult supervision. I've been left to my own recognizance. And uh, that, that is, uh, you, could, you could pray for me on that front and pray for those that I encounter as a result. But Debbie is back home uh, attending uh, the fi- home fires there. And uh, so she's not with me this trip. But Lord willing, if I come back to do my first defense of my dissertation, Uh, later at the end of the year she'll come with me at that stage and I'm sure we'll pay you a visit then so um, but pray for my wife Uh, South Africa is in very very troubled times and uh, they have uh, the African National Congress which is essentially a Marxist political uh, group has destroyed the energy grid over the last 28 years of their rule and uh, we are now left with a energy grid that is about to totally collapse. And you can imagine what that does to day-to-day life and living. And all of our people are distracted in the midst of everything that's going on. Uh, that has far, far-reaching repercussions for the economy. Um, uh, the, the country is in dire straits and they are headed for total collapse. Um, we've decided that we're going to stay there. We've, we staked our claim there 28 years ago this month, and uh, we will continue to stay as long as we possibly can uh, to continue the work that God has started there. Uh, because when I look at what's going on over here, I'm like, well, yeah, you know, you pick your poison, right? And uh, better to deal with the devil you do know than the devil you don't know. And uh, so there are some advantages to living in a country that's collapsing. They can't track me uh, with all of their digital wherewithal that they're trying to impose on us in this day and age. So there are advantages to that. Plus, our lot can't get their act together. They're not organized to be able to have digital IDs and those types of things. And there's no electricity to have it anyway. So um, we've been blessed by God to be able to install an inverter with a, with a 5.5 kilowatt lithium battery. Uh, just the week before I left, we finally were able to install solar panels. Uh, you can't even get solar panels in the country now. And it's not that I'm sold on solar, but uh, it's better to have some energy than no energy. And uh, especially when you're trying to study 
and trying to do the work of the Lord. You need some light for that, and you need some Wi-Fi. Uh, but do pray for all of us over there uh, as we encounter these turbulent times. Uh, because I do believe we will end up just like Zimbabwe or Mozambique or Angola or any other number of sub-Saharan African countries. And uh, so the only difference is we did have a first world infrastructure and we've been incrementally working our way back to the third world. And uh, that's where we will ultimately end up. So pray for us, that will provide some opportunities, but it also provides many multiple challenges for ministry in that context. As people are distracted, as they're losing their jobs, uh, the economy begins to unravel even more than it has. I mean, we, we have unemployment of 45%. So that gives you some idea of how bad the economy is over there. And uh, so poverty is rife. And our homeless problem there is not because people are on fentanyl or drugs or alcohol. It's because there's simply no economy in which they can work. And uh, so it's, it's heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, it's hard to know how to meet those challenges because it's so systemic. But that's, that's what we're encountering. But we'll remain there by God's good grace and continue to keep our hand at the plow, the Berean Bible Institute. We have uh, some 28 students currently. Uh, most of those are auditing. Six of them are doing it for credit, for Bachelor of Theology credit. And uh, there are some real positive signs on the horizon for us uh, as we seek to expand our program. So be in prayer for, for that as well. We're very pleased at what God's doing there. So that's just a little bit about the ministry. But I'm here to share God's word with you this morning. And so if you would take your copy of God's word and turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, I'll be camping on verse 13 this morning. And so I'd like to begin reading in verse 13 and read down through verse seven, uh, 17. Um, 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 13, and please excuse me, I... You always forget to pack something when you come, and I forgot to pack my large letter uh, edition, New American Standard, so I'm reading my old Bible and uh, with old eyes, so there's, there's a bit of a problem with that. But beginning in verse 13, Peter said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit, Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to your former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth. Let's just ask God to bless his word. Father, again, I thank you for Roosevelt Community Church, for the many fruitful years of partnership that we have enjoyed with these dear saints and we ask your continued blessing upon thee on them this morning and pray that you would take them from strength to strength and blessing to blessing even in these very challenging and uncertain times now bless us as we rally around the word of god may you lift our burdens at the foot of calvary and may you mold us and shape us and sculpt us into the uh, image bearers of Christ that you would have us to be. And we pray all these things in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, this morning, the title of my message is Pursuing a Well-Adorned Mind. When I was growing up here in Southern California in the Pacific Northwest, you might remember 
the commercial, if you're as old as I am, uh, a commercial warning about the dangers of drug use. And it showed an egg frying in a pool of hot grease in a cast iron skillet with the moniker, this is your brain on drugs. Now at the end of that commercial, they said this, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Indeed, a mind is a very terrible thing to waste. And there are numerous ways in which one can waste their mind, not only with drugs and alcohol. This is true of Christians as well. And one of the greatest dangers that blood-bought believers face is when they park their minds in neutral and never give their salvation the thought that it deserves. And given our hyper-subjective culture and our uber-uber-emotional era, it's far too easy to succumb to the status quo of how we feel as a Christian. And we begin to feel our way through the Christian life rather than thinking our way through it. As a result... We become rather earthbound in our faith with no real sense of acknowledgement of the eternal. Now the Bible has much to say about the mind. And in the Old Testament, especially, and even in the New Testament, there are many times and many places where the term heart could be, is a substitute for mind as you think about the ancient Hebraic way of thinking. And there are numerous kinds of minds that are mentioned in the Bible. And you can get a concordance and you can look it up for yourself and see the many ways that the Bible uses the term and nuances the term mind, both positively and negatively, of course. Um, the Bible talks about in Luke 1.51 that you can have a proud mind or a proud heart. And indeed, that is true. And that's, that's something we, we all face and fight at some point in our lives. Paul in Colossians 1.21, he talked much about the mind in his epistles. But in Colossians 1.21, he says that there is a hostile mind. And it's that hostile mind that is engaged in evil deeds. And that is what Christ saves us from. In, in his epistle to the second in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, he talks about a hardened mind. And that's where the mind becomes trammeled and trafficked and hard packed because of the way that it's been thinking, the thought patterns that have taken place. Uh, later on in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, he talks about a blinded mind. And then in 2 Corinthians 11.3, he talks about the straying mind. Uh, there are all manner of minds. Even our Lord talked about the mind. And in fact, there's, there's one cross-reference that has always intrigued me. And it's found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6 and verse 11. I'll read this one. Um, just by way of context, but the situation is the Lord healing a man who had a withered hand on the Sabbath. Now, of course, that didn't go down very well with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the various um, naysayers that were there to survey the situation. And at the end of it all, in verse 10 of Luke 6, he said, and after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they themselves, now this would be the Pharisees and the Herodians, were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. The term rage there is the word for mind. And it's, it's a little noun that means to go against the mind. So they were filled. They were going against all rational, reasonable thought. 
They were seething mad, and as a result, the Pharisees took counsel with the Herodians, who were their mortal enemies, and they collaborated together against the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how out of their minds they were. They were filled with absolute rage. This is hysteria. It's a lot like when Roe v. Wade was overturned just a few months ago. Last June or May when that took place, you might remember all of the, the rage that took place as a result of that and screaming and crying and gnashing of teeth and shaking of the fist. That is what is being spoken of here, the kind of rage that our Lord spoke of in Luke 6, 11. And our culture is submerged and drowning in this kind of a mind today. Then you have the depraved or the reprobate mind of Romans 1.28 where it says there that God gave them over to a reprobate mind and that, that is, just means that there is a present day judicial sentence of God whereby he will take a society who has turned their back on him and worships the creature rather than the creator and they reach a stage where God judges them by turning them over to their rabid thinking. And the result of that is they are no longer able to discern between right and wrong and good and evil. So right becomes wrong, wrong becomes right, good becomes evil, and evil becomes good. This is right where we live. This is downtown for us today. Earlier in Romans, Romans 1.21, he talks about their foolish heart or their foolish mind was darkened. So the, the mind is something spoken of very often. Of course, there are positive portrayals. Paul talks about an obedient mind in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Um, our Lord talked about the greatest commandment of all is where you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. So there again, the mind is included. Christianity is not divorced of the thought processes that take place. And then there is a mind that focuses on the eternal hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. That's what 1 Peter 1.13 is addressing. And so I turn back to 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We find this verse couched in the suffering of those first century believers. In what is now modern day Turkey, in the north central reaches of modern day Turkey, those early believers, it's about 64 A.D. or so at the, at the time that this was written, maybe 65 A.D. And the Roman government is now beginning to take a jaundiced view of this 30-year-old sect called Christianity. Rome is just burned. Nero lit the match, burned two-thirds of Rome to the ground, blamed the Christians, and the fallout from that is the beginning of persecution. It had far-reaching effects and gradually rippled out to the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire. Up until that time, Rome had been rather uh, ambiguous and ambivalent about this Christian sect, and they allowed them to get on with what they did. But now, it's 65 AD, P Peter pins this first epistle that bears 
his name and he's writing to warn them about the fiery trial that is about to engulf them, that is going to descend upon them. A trial where they would be categorized right alongside of murderers, thieves, insurrectionists, and evildoers. We've reached that place here in the United States of America. Today, if you believe what I believe about the Word of God, you could be classified by the Department of Homeland Security as a potential domestic terrorist. I know I have that look about me. If you go to a public school board meeting and you confront them about their gender identity curriculum, you are immediately labeled. I heard the other day about a woman who was sued by the school district she was in for doing just that. A teacher down in in Orange County two weeks ago was fired for failing to Keep parents in the dark about what is being taught about gender identity in their school system. Good is evil. Evil is now good. We live in similar times. The issues might be different, but the parallels are uncanny. And so, in 1 Peter 1.13, there are four actions here that we are treated to that will help us in our context, at our place in history, have well-adorned minds that will enable us to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. First one is consider your possession. The second one is concentrate on your eternal hope. The third one is cultivate your mind, have a well-prepared mind. And the fourth action is control your thoughts. Keep a sober mind. Be sober-minded. Let's unpack the first one ever so briefly. How do we endure suffering? As these first century believers did. Number one, Peter says this, consider your possession. Consider your salvation. Consider your Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice what he does at the very beginning of verse 13. Therefore, based on everything I have said in these first 12 verses, Consider this. You see, if you really want to understand how to run the gauntlet that is before us right here, right now, in 2023, we must first consider our possession, our eternal possession, salvation, based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so the therefore is pointing back to all of the preceding material, which includes a very rich recitation of the believer's calling and election and the glories of salvation that every believer enjoys because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so this then serves as the foundation and the cornerstone and the basis for surviving the temporal tempest on this terrestrial ball. And Peter reminds them of their rich spiritual heritage and inheritance that is theirs in Christ. And so as part of considering their their possession, he, he says first that they are to consider that they are chosen sojourners. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen. Some commentators take the chosen there and see it as an adjective, modifying sojourners. 
That's one way you can take it. So the idea here is that we are chosen, elect, sojourners according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. As chosen sojourners, our true homeland is heaven. It's not earth. Their earthly residence is temporary. It's not permanent. Believers have a city whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11 says. And when you are in Jesus Christ, you are nothing but a pilgrim passing through. And while we might have a permanent residence permit or a green card, our passport is clearly stamped heaven. You see, as resident aliens, we're not the same. There are some distinguishable characteristics between us and the world around us. At least there should be. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. The best way I can illustrate it is I am a permanent resident in South Africa. I am a resident alien. I know that explains a lot. And no matter how hard I may try, I will never truly be fully South African, even though I've been there almost 30 years. And the South Africans delight in reminding me of this. Because they actually think I have an accent. They don't understand they're the ones with the accent. I don't have an accent. But my speech is different. My colloquialisms are different. My mannerisms are different. Our cultures are different. And even though I try to adopt and adapt, as hard as I try, I will never watch a cricket match. It's not going to happen. I would rather watch paint dry or grass grow, but I'm not watching a cricket match. I don't watch cricket, and I don't eat crickets. <laughs> it's not my cup of tea. When it comes to having a barbecue or what they call a braai, they love a wood fire. I much prefer a gas grill because I want to eat in this century, not the next century. My pronunciations are rather distinct, and they remind me of this all the time. I say pastor, they say pastor. I say tomato, they say tomato. I say potato, oddly enough, they say potato too. <laughs> I call it ketchup, they call it tomato sauce. But that's okay. When they begin talking about Mexican food, they couldn't pronounce it to save their lives. I have to remind them, it's not taco, it's taco. It's not tortilla, it's tortilla. It's not jalapeno, it's jalapeno. That's the only time I have the advantage. You see, we're so chosen sojourners. We're just passing through. But all of this is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I like how Wayne Grudem defines foreknowledge because he brings the relational aspect of it to bear upon this passage. He said this, concerning foreknowledge, but to, uh, concerning the foreknowledge of God the Father, but to his knowing people with a personal, loving, fatherly knowledge, according to God's fatherly care for you before the world was made. This implies that their status as sojourners, their privileges as God's chosen people, even their hostile environment were all known by God before the world began. And thus, in accordance with his fatherly love for his own, such foreknowledge is laden with comfort for Peter's readers. None of this catches God unawares. He knew it in eternity past. That means he'll give us the grace to see us through. 
And so they, as part of considering their possession of salvation, they were to consider that they are chosen sojourners. A second part of considering their possession is they are to consider their end time inheritance. Verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Now there's a lot to unpack that we won't unpack. The point is, there is joy in the future heavenly reward. So there is always something to praise the Lord for, even in the midst of the darkest trial, the deepest trench of suffering, because the believer has a living hope. That living hope is the carrot that dangles in the st- on the string before us all of the time. And this living hope is key to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To the empty tomb. And so we're to consider the end of the line. The finish line. The inheritance that awaits. In line with that, in verses 6 through 9, they are to consider their, uh, further consider their inheritance because he expands on that theme in verses 6 through 9 where he says this, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and the full glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. They are to consider their future inheritance which gives them joy in suffering. There is a deep spiritual joy and rejoicing in God for all that he has done. And what Peter is doing here is he is demonstrating to these first century believers that grief and pain coexist with joy. It's not one or the other. It is oftentimes a matter of both and. You can have that heavenly joy in the midst of the deepest pain and the deepest grief that you might be encountering. But understand that that pain and that suffering is temporal, whereas the joy is eternal. Therefore, our joy is not tethered to this world nor is it tethered to the circumstances or our situation of this world. It is indeed otherworldly. So they are to consider their future inheritance. Then they are to consider their unique blessings. What are their unique blessings? Well, he outlines that in verses 10 through 12. He begins in verse 10, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made a careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicated as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And these things which now have become announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Simply put, 
They enjoy the blessings that the ancient prophets did not. The ancient prophets foretold of the glories that would come through Jesus Christ. Those were mysteries to those ancients, but those mysteries have now been explained and cleared away, and they fully understand what was intended by those Old Testament prophecies. Not only that, the, the, they now enjoy a salvation that even piques the curiosity of the angels in heaven. So they enjoy a blessing that others before them did not. And yet those who went before them were faithful, even when they encountered difficult times. So the point is, that the commands that follow from verse 13 on, and there are 34 imperative commands in 1 Peter, are rooted, anchored, grounded in verses 1 to 12. And so great a salvation, and so great a Savior. There is no marching orders until you're standing firmly on the platform and foundation that has been laid in Christ Jesus. And so the reality of what is proceeds and gives way to the commands of what one must do in light of so great a salvation. And because they possess so great a salvation by so great a Savior, they are to live and act in a certain way which reflects that salvation even when the going gets tough. Proving once again that sound theology always should lead us to the threshold of living in light of such truths. So consider your possession of salvation. Secondly, the second action for enduring difficult times is concentrate on your eternal hope. Fix your hope. Again, verse 13. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The main verb there is fix the hope. That's why I begin with that, even though sequentially in our English version it comes third. There are two other verbal ideas, but they really back up and buttress the idea of fixing your hope. The nature of this hope that we're to fix, simple definition, hope is an eager expectation that does not disappoint. There is a confident expectation which is far stronger than the vague notions of, well, I hope so. I wish upon that star. I have a dream. I mean, Oprah is always on about the dream. Live your dream. Problem is, most people's dreams end up as a nightmare. In the New Testament, it always refers to the expectation of something good. Hope is vital to the Christian message, which is why earlier Peter refers to the living hope in his introduction. Now here are five truths about biblical hope. These these are not original with me. I took them from someone else. But the first is this. Hope is never self-centered or self-serving because it is always focused on Jesus Christ, his gospel, and God the Father. So it's not about me. The hope isn't in me. If the hope's in me, that's called hopeless. Secondly, hope never rests on good works, but rather on the gracious work provided through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul said in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Thirdly, hope encourages Christians who are in the midst of some great trial. Not that the trial is whisked away, but rather that God sees us through that trial and gives us a hope and encouragement along the way to endure. Thirdly, hope leads to reordering one's priorities in accordance with God's agenda and God's will. Our priority is heaven not earth. Earth is 
place somewhat down the order there. And then finally, hope inevitably leads to ethical changes in one's life. 1 John 3, 3. And everyone who has his hope fixed on him, meaning Christ, purifies himself just as he is pure. So hope is that eager expectation. Hope is fully set on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the revelation. That which is yet to be revealed that has not taken place. And so we live in that time of anticipation of this great revealing which will someday take place. Maybe even today. Who knows? Even now we live in the imminent expectation of the Lord's return. Aren't you glad you're not post-millennial? Trying to usher in the kingdom. I have friends who are post-millennial. And we are friends. And I'm often telling them, man, if you're bringing in the kingdom, you're doing a pretty poor job. It's not getting better, my friend. It's getting worse. Oh, you're such a pessimist. That's your pessimistic eschatology. No, I think that's the word of God, my friend. Our hope will be fully set on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And hope's greatest desire is that believers are to live in the present, displaying their greatest desire as the consummation of the work that God began in them through Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm not glorified yet. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. I have a long way to go. I tell her every day, honey, God's not finished with me yet. She said, I wish he'd hurry up. What did Paul say? Philippians 1.6 I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so if we are going to make our way through this wind-tossed world, we are going to have to concentrate on our eternal hope and fix our hope on the revelation in Christ that is yet to come. And we are to consider our possession of eternal salvation in Him. And thirdly, we are to cultivate our minds. Prepare our minds. What does He say here? Now that you fixed your hope, gird your minds. Gird your minds. What does that mean? Prepare yourself to think. It's not easy, is it? I often joke, and maybe I've said it here, I I don't know, but I've said in other churches, God has a wonderful sense of humor. I mean, I just floated through high school. I don't think I ever looked at a book. Somehow I made it through. I mean, when I was a senior at Battleground High School in Battleground, Washington, I was voted as the most likely never to be academic. And now I am the academic dean of the Berean Bible Institute. Pray for them. (laughs) You cultivate your mind. Gird up your minds, of course, is a clause that has reference to the oriental custom of gathering one's external robes and pulling it up and tucking it in to the belt or the sash so that you can make forward motion unimpeded. Whether you're running, whether you're walking, or whether you're in battle. You see, they didn't have spandex. They didn't have yoga pants. We must gird up our minds and discipline our minds to think right thoughts. So that as Paul said in Romans 12 too, we might be transformed by the renewing of our minds rather than conformed, in other words, submitting to the external pressures of the world around us. We're transformed, not conformed in our thinking. 
This is referring not to mere wishful thinking or unfounded optimism, but rather to mental resolve. This is a mental resolve where one sets one's hope on the future grace of completed salvation in Jesus Christ, which is yet to be revealed. Focusing more intently on the things to come than on today's headlines. That's not an excuse for being ignorant of what's going on around us, but rather, don't be consumed by the headlines. Be consumed by what is yet to come in Christ. And the objective of all of this is the mind. The concept here is that the understanding works together with the will to affect the right conduct. It begins in the mind. It informs the emotions. And the emotions kick the will into gear. And so this is a premeditated disposition or an attitude that begins to actively think based on 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12. In short, it is disciplined thinking with reference to the blessings of redemptive grace. And we must think in a new way as a believer in Jesus Christ. This doesn't happen automatically. It is going to require effort. It requires concentration. It is going to require intention, intentionality. Simple way of putting it is, get your mind in the game. Get your mind right. I still remember as a boy watching that movie, Cool Hand Luke. And Luke is told by the warder, Boy, get your mind right! That's what it means to fix your mind, to gird your mind. Spurgeon put it this way. Therefore, when your mind is instructed concerning some grand truth, After you have sucked the honey and joy out of it, always say to yourself, but what are the bearings of this doctrine upon my life? How should it influence me? What would God have me to do as a result of receiving teaching, such teaching as this? Wearsby puts it this way, outlook determines outcome and attitude determines action. How are we to survive in this wind-tossed world? We are to cultivate our minds, prepare our minds for action, concentrate on the eternal hope that is ours, and consider our possession, which is salvation. Finally, the last action that Peter treats us to in verse 13 is control your thoughts. Control your thoughts. Because he says here again, if you look at the page, in, in 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. This speaks of a mental and a spiritual alertness that is not given to the mental intoxication and excesses and emotional rashness and impulsiveness that the world is. In other words, our thought life is more self-controlled and disciplined and not given to the extremes that exist out there. Positively, having a sober mind simply means to have a well-balanced, self-controlled thought life that is not in the danger of irrational thinking or irrational fury like we saw at the beginning of the message in Luke 6.11 when the Pharisees and Herodians were filled with rage. Rather, it is a restrained mind that does not gravitate to the extremes or the excesses of the world around us. Paul admonished Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 5, at the end of Paul's own life, he told Timothy, be sober in all things. Simply put, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. 
by not allowing outside forces and circumstances to control you. It's having a proactive mind instead of a reactionary mind that responds to everything that's going on around us. All of which implies that we are to live in reality. You see, there are far too many people, including Christians today, who don't live in reality. They live in la-la land. And everything's wonderful in la-la land. It's like the old conservative talk radio show host, Rush Limbaugh said, I am the mayor of Realityville. Well, so am I. I constantly tell our people in South Africa, I am the mayor of reality, and you need to be a citizen of Realityville. That's what it means to have a sober mind. When one is under the gun and taking enemy fire, one needs to keep their head even when everyone else around you is losing theirs. In chapter 4 and verse 7 of 1 Peter, he reiterates the command, to the end of all, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Then again in chapter 5 and verse 8 of 1 Peter, Peter says it again. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There are other places in Scripture. Paul says to have a sober mind, to be sober-minded. If ever we needed to have a sober mind, it is today. Because in case you haven't noticed, the whole world around us is going berserk. It's not only in America. It is everywhere. Everything today is hyperbolized and exaggerated to the extreme by the media and the politicians and the academics. Everything from COVID to climate change to preferred pronouns. As a footnote, do you know what my preferred pronouns are? Truth and honesty. And you say, but brother, those are conceptual nouns. I know it, but they self-identify as pronouns. (laughs) The world has gone absolutely bonkers. And their reprobate mind has taken them further and further out to sea from the land of reality. New Testament scholar Thomas Schreiner said, Peter was not merely saying that believers should refrain from drunkenness of mind. There is a way of living that becomes dull to the reality of God that is anesthetized by the attractions of this world. When people are lulled into such drowsiness or laziness of mind, they lose sight of Christ's future revelation of himself and concentrate only on fulfilling their earthly desires. So how do you keep from losing your head and going off the deep end without the aid of pharmaceuticals, or alcohol, or some other form of escapism. Number one, consider your possession of salvation in Jesus Christ. Number two, concentrate on your eternal hope in Christ because of the empty tomb. Number three, cultivate your mind for action. Get your mind in the game. And number four, control your thoughts instead of allowing the current culture to control your thoughts. Wiersbe sums it up well. Christians live in the future tense. Their present actions and decisions are governed by this future hope. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for this wonderful church. 
I thank you for their pastor and their elders and their other leaders. And I thank you for each one that comprises Roosevelt Community Church. Father, help them to continue doing well and to not grow weary in well-doing, even in this wind-tossed world. Help us all by your grace and the power and the strength that you alone afford. Help us to con constantly, continually consider our possession of salvation in Christ. And to concentrate on the inheritance which is ours. Help us to consider the hope to gird our minds and to be sober in our thoughts. Father, we need your help. We need your word. We need your spirit. And we need a willingness and a humility on our part to apply it to our lives. Grant us that, we pray. And we pray all these things in Christ's name alone. Amen.